In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Welcome back, my brothers and sisters, to our journey through the book of Exodus. Today, we talk about one of the highlights in the book of Exodus, when the glory of God entered into the tabernacle. It's important to understand that the entire narrative in the book of Exodus is leading us to this point in chapter 40. And many readers actually miss this point. And so Moses assembles the tabernacle according to the command of God, and then the cloud of glory at the very end of the book enters into the tabernacle. It's God's way of saying, I want to dwell in your midst. So let's go through the chapter and we're going to talk about why this chapter is so important. It actually looks back to the seven days of creation and back to the Garden of Eden. And so we're going to talk about how this action looks back to the seven days of creation and the Garden of Eden. So let's begin our study. So reading through the narrative, it says, the Lord said to Moses on the first day of of the first month, you shall erect the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. Notice that they've been in the desert. This is going to happen. The tabernacle is going to be raised up on essentially the one year anniversary of their desert journey. So that's very significant. And you shall put in it the ark of the testimony and you shall screen the ark with the veil. Now, you guys know that the veil is going to separate the holy place from the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant will be. And you shall bring in the table. What was the table? The table was the table with the bread of the presence, 12 loaves uh, in, in, in total. And only the priest could eat this bread. It was changed periodically, and only the priest could eat this bread. So that's important. Uh, and it says, and set its arrangements in order, and you shall bring in the lampstand. The lampstand is the seven-branched lampstand, the menorah. And so that would be brought in. The table and the menorah and the altar of incense would be in the holy place. The Ark of the Covenant would be in the Holy of Holies behind the veil. And it says, and you shall put the golden altar for incense before the ark of the testimony, okay, and set up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. So you see there's a veil, there's a screen. The area of the Holy of Holies is essentially veiled and screened off. And just outside of it is the altar of incense. It's important to recognize that when you read Luke's gospel, Zechariah the priest is actually standing at this altar when Gabriel appears to him right in the very beginning of Luke's gospel. So uh, a little background in Exodus 40 helps us to understand the beginning of Luke's gospel. And it says in chapter 40, verse 6, you shall set the altar, the altar burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle. So the best way to remember this is there's two altars. There's an altar of incense, which is in the holy place just before the holy of holies, and then outside, there's an altar for burnt offerings. And it says, uh, of the tent of meeting, the place of the laver between the tent of meeting and the altar. Now, the language tent of meeting is very important as well, because the tent of meeting, uh, it referred to a place outside of the camp where Moses would meet the Lord. And here... The reference is to actually the holy place. The, the, so now it, the, the, the actual location of the tent of meeting is changing to the holy place. And it says, it goes on and it talks about, um, it says putting water in the laver. The laver is, is a place of washing where the priest would wash themselves before they went into the tabernacle. And it says, and you shall set up the court round about it and hang up the screens for the gate of the court. And then you shall take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and all that is in it and consecrate it and all the furniture and it shall become holy. So notice how everything is consecrated. It's set apart for a special 
purpose. That's what it means to be holy. And so this would all be done with anointing oil as well. And that's important because we only hear about anointing oil usually when referring to priests, prophets, and uh, and kings, and, and they're, they're, they're anointed figures. As a matter of fact, we only have biblical examples of priests uh, being anointed and kings being anointed. There's no example of a prophet. Some scholars think that maybe it was a spiritual anointing. They're not 100% sure. Uh, but regardless of that, you see how anointing oil is also used for the consecration of the tabernacle. Uh, and it goes on and it's, it, it says that you shall anoint the altar, the utensils, um, the altar of burnt offerings, uh, and consecrate the altar. You shall also anoint the laver and its base and consecrate it. And you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tent of meeting. This is the, this is the very entrance to go inside the tabernacle and wash them with water and put upon Aaron the holy garments. Notice that Aaron is being vested by Moses and you shall anoint him and consecrate him that he may serve me as a, as priest. Now notice this, He's Moses the prophet is going to vest him and anoint him so that he can serve the Lord as priest. And you shall bring his sons also and put coats on them and anoint them as you anointed their father, that they may serve me as priest and their anoint their anointing shall admit them to a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. So it says that thus did Moses according to all that the Lord commanded him. So he did. And in the first month of the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was erected. Moses erected the tabernacle. He laid its bases and set up its frames and put in its poles and raised up its pillars. He spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent over it as the Lord had commanded Moses. Notice how he's setting up everything. And then he took the testimony, the commandments, and put it into the ark and put poles in the ark and set the mercy seat above the ark. What was the mercy seat? A lot of times people will ask that question. This is the covering of the Ark of the Covenant where two uh, cherubim angels are mounted on the top and they're bowing down, forming essentially a throne. Uh, and so it's the very covering of the Ark of the Covenant, the place when the high priest would enter on the Day of Atonement, according to Leviticus chapter 16, he would sprinkle blood, the blood of bulls and the blood of goats over that area. So now we're going to go down a little bit and we're going to look at how these events take place place. Okay, so what's important in this narrative is the Lord is going to manifest his presence. He guided Israel out of Egypt. He manifested his presence in the form of a pillar of a cloud during the day and a pillar of fire during the night. You can find that in Exodus chapter 13. And he guided them on their desert journey. And so he gives the command to raise the tabernacle. Now, the command to raise the tabernacle is very important. He's giving Moses the command. In other words, there's no doubt. And so the command, it's going to unfold in this way. In seven stages, the tabernacle is going to be raised, okay? And I've got the verses highlighted over here on the top of the screen, but it really looks back to creation because the tabernacle and later the temple will be like a microcosm of the cosmos, of the world, okay? And not only that, but the materials used in the tabernacle are the same materials described in the Garden of Eden. So you can go back to Exodus 25. You can look at that video. And we go through these materials in that video in Exodus 25 as well, if you want to get some more background. So let's look at the stages. So the first stage, raising of the tabernacle on the first month of the second year of the first day of the month. So the first day of the month is also mentioned in Genesis 8, 13. That's really interesting. First day of the month of the second year. And that's when the waters of the flood were dried up. So there's actually some correspondence with the flood as well, uh, which was also the day when Noah turned 600, according to the narrative. 
Hence, the first day of the month can also convey a sense of a new beginning. Moses raised the tabernacle, the word mishkan, it's a Hebrew word, from the verb yeshan, which has the sense of dwelling or sitting. Hence, the Lord is making his dwelling place with his people. Understood correctly, the reader will see that the book of Exodus ends in a glorious manner with the Lord expressing his personal desire to dwell with Israel and inviting Israel to obediently, obediently carry out the Lord's commands. So when you see it this way, you, you can see how the promise of the Lord is now being fulfilled through covenant obedience. Uh, and so they laid the bases, the tent is draped, they do everything according to the Lord's command. Now you might remember on the first day of creation, God creates light and night is distinguished from day. So the tabernacle would distinguish the Lord's holy dwelling place from all that was common and profane. So suddenly there's a, there's a, there's a separation, there's a, an act of distinguishing all that is holy from all that is profane. That's very important. And so the people of Israel are called to live lives of holiness. They are distinguished as a holy people. So now the second stage is when uh, the testimony, the commandments, are placed within the Ark of the Covenant and the cover, the hakaporet, the mercy seat, is placed upon the Ark. The term hakaporet, it refers to the cover upon which the two cherubim with their wings were bowing down, pointing to each other. And this cover is also referred to as the place of propitiation or the mercy seat. So it has a number of names. You're going to see this when you read different Bibles, and often in the same Bible, it might be translated in various ways. So just to give you a roadmap here so you know what they're talking about. So the cover formed something of a throne, underlining that Israel's true king was the Lord. He was enthroned in the midst of his people on the wings of angels. And so they placed the poles into the ark so that no one could touch it. He set the mercy seat, the place of propitiation, the cover upon the top of the ark. He brought the ark into the temple. He set up the curtain and he, he caused to be screened off the ark of testimony. So as the Lord had commanded Moses, all is done according to the Lord's command. And really interestingly, when you go back to creation, you look at the, sec the second day of creation, God creates a firmament between the waters and he calls the firmament heaven. And this is really important here, the division between the waters on earth and the waters uh, or the firmament in heaven. It distinguishes the waters on earth from heaven. And so what's the thematic similarity? Is there any similarity? The action of placing the testimonies in the Ark of the Covenant, placing the mercy seat upon the Ark, the poles in the Ark, bringing it uh, in to the into the Holy of Holies, and then setting up the curtain between the most holy place on earth, uh, the Holy of Holies, has some similar, similar theological themes. Indeed, in ancient Israel cosmology, this will be the place where heaven and earth meet. And so there's something very profound there about distinguishing the waters in heaven from the, you know, the, the heavens from the waters on earth. And also the concept of here, this is the place where heaven and earth meet. So that's very profound if you consider that. Hence, we see two forms of separation between the waters on earth and the waters in heaven during creation. And here, a separation between the Holy of Holies and everything else that is outside. So let's go to the third stage. The third straight stage involves the bread of the presence or the bread of presence. He placed the table, the Shuchan, in the tent of meeting uh, on the north side outside the curtain. And what's really interesting is uh, the tent of meeting formerly was a tent outside of the camp. And now it's going to be referred to, uh, this is the holy place, okay, inside the tabernacle, but not in the Holy of Holies. And so you see something changing here. Why is this change important? Because now God is dwelling in the midst of his people. This is the key. That's why this, this vocabulary is being applied to the holy place of the tabernacle. God is taking residence. He's dwelling in the midst of his people.
So the table for the bread of the presence contained 12 loaves of unleavened bread. It was regularly rotated by the priest, and only the consecrated priest could eat this bread. Now, the concept of bread in the presence of God and literally the bread of the presence is extremely important in a certain way. It's preparing us to understand the Holy Eucharist, my brothers and sisters. That's what it's doing. And so as the Lord had commanded Moses, all of this is prepared. At creation, God separated the waters from the dry land, and he calls the dry land the earth, the waters the sea. The Lord commanded that every form of vegetation would come forth from the earth, and we are told twice that it was good on the third day. And a unique aspect of the third day of creation is that there's a double blessing. And you think about it, you know, grain comes forth. It's a staple of life. And the table for the bread of the presence would contain bread. As we say in the Eucharistic prayer, we say, well, before we get to the Eucharistic prayer, during when the priest is preparing the gifts uh, at Mass, he, he says prayers. And part of that is mentioning how this bread that we have is the fruit of the earth and the work of human hands and how it will become for us the bread of life. And so the bread of the presence, it, it tells you something about God's providence, the way God provides for his people, but it's also preparing us to understand the gift of the Eucharist. And so chapter uh, stage four, in stage four, the menorah, the lampstand is put in the tabernacle. He put the menorah lampstand in the tent of meeting op, uh, opposite the table on the southern side. So by now you realize that the tent of meeting refers to the holy place in the tabernacle, not the holy of holies, but the place in the tabernacle just outside of the holy of holies. And he elevated the lamps in the presence of the Lord as the Lord had commanded. Notice how this 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 uh, phrase repeats again and again. At creation, God created lights in the firmament of the heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars. So really thematically, you can see something here. Wow, the fourth stage or step is bringing in the menorah. And on the fourth day of creation, God created the luminaries, the sun, the moon, and the stars. It's amazing if you think about that. Now, the fifth stage is the altar of incense. He set up the altar of gold in the tent of meeting before the curtain. Okay, so the altar is right next to the curtain that separates the Holy of Holies. And he offered fragrant, fragrant incense on upon it as the Lord had commanded Moses. Notice how this, this, this repetition of this phrase helps us to understand each stage. So, what happened on the fifth day of creation? God commanded that the waters would swarm with living creatures and also birds to fly above the earth and in the firmament of heaven. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. So is there any similarity thematically? The swarming creatures and the command to be fruitful and multiply, it underlines the Lord's desire to bless all of creation. The incense on the golden altar points to the constant prayer of Israel, which rose up to heaven, to the pleasing character of their worship. So as creation proclaims God's glory, so Israel would worship the Lord and ask for his blessing. So that's very profound. Number six, the sixth stage, the altar for burnt offerings. Okay, so... What was the altar for burnt offerings? It's the altar that's outside of the tabernacle. The incense altar is inside. The burnt offerings are outside. And so it says that he set in place the screen of the entrance of the tabernacle. So notice how you've got three divisions, a division between the Holy of Holies, another screen at the entrance uh, going into the tent of meeting, also known as the holy place. And then you'll have another screen um, that uh, uh, separates the courtyard, okay, from what is outside. So, hence, there was a screen at the entrance to the holy place, also known as the tent of meeting, uh, and then a larger veil at the entrance to the holy of holies. He placed the altar of burnt offerings at the entrance to the tabernacle. This altar was just outside of the tabernacle uh, uh, of the tent of meeting, the holy place. Hence, 
he offered on it burnt offerings and grain offerings and this this offering or these offerings likely refers to the tamid the tamid was the first offering of the day the last offering of the day an unblemished lamb a continual offering which was to be offered each day thus moses was faithful to this command as the lord commanded and so at creation on the sixth day god commanded that the earth bring forth living creatures the beasts of the earth the cattle etc and then he creates man in his own image and likeness he create god creates them male and female blesses them telling to be fruitful and multiply so what's the similarity here well just as god created the living, you know, he created the living creatures on the sixth day. And then at the end of the day, he created, he created man, male and female in his own image and likeness. Humans would offer these offerings to the Lord in the tabernacle. So what's really amazing, if you think about it, you know, that those very creatures that the Lord created on the sixth day, they would offer to the Lord. And the theology behind this is very profound because in the book of Le Leviticus, it underlines that all of these creatures really, they really belong to the Lord to begin with. He's giving you these out of creation. Uh, and so it's not like it didn't belong to God beforehand. Uh, and so we're going to get into that if we study the book of Leviticus. And I'm hoping to put together a playlist on the book of Leviticus in the future. So look for that. So now what about the seventh stage? So the seventh stage, they set up the laver for washing. The laver is a place between the tent of meeting, the holy place, and between the altar for burnt offerings, okay? So he placed water in it for washing. Every priest would have to wash before they went into the tabernacle. This helps us to understand a little bit about baptism, if you think about it, that each one of us who's been baptized in Jesus Christ, we, we've been washed, but the real washing is a work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so through the work of this sacrament, God has done a new work in our life, and we are a new creation in Jesus Christ. We belong to his family. So Moses and Aaron and his sons, they washed their hands and their feet. Hence, the priest that ministered in the tabernacle would wash before entering. So this is what we would call ritual washing here. Okay, it was it was there were various forms of washing that had to take place. If you want to see another example, you can go to Leviticus chapters 13 and 14. And when a leper is purified of leprosy, there's a washing that he has to do or she. Um, and if they're cured of that leprosy, um, they, they, sh they shave, they cut all their hair, they shave and they wash. And then they bring a sacrifice to the tabernacle slash temple. Um, so there's some washings that are prescribed in scripture. Uh, and so it says he raised up the court. That's the kind of like the fenced off area around the tabernacle. And thus Moses completed the work. So notice the seventh day, it, 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 it finishes with Moses completed the work. It looks back to the Sabbath. So just as Moses completed the work, so at creation, God finishes the work of creation and rested on the sabbath so you can really see some incredible um, thematic similarities between the seven stages of setting up the tabernacle and the events that take place um, and so there's a seven step process and so it harkens back to the work of god at creation and it's underlining something incredible god is doing a marvelous work here he is going to dwell in the midst of his people He's, he's calling his people to live in holiness, to consecrate themselves to him. And so the, the next event that takes place is absolutely marvelous. The cloud of glory enters the tabernacle. This is God's way of saying, I'm consecrating and blessing this place and I am with you. So when they see the cloud of glory enter, everybody has to get out. And the cloud of glory enters and they know right away the Lord is present. And so the very, uh, this, this actually, this event of consecration, it actually happens a second time in Israel's history. Uh, when Solomon builds the temple, the same thing happens. Everybody get out 
and the cloud of glory enters into the temple hundreds of years later. So Moses finished the work, and when he finished, the cloud of glory entered, and it said that the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. This is absolutely amazing. The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses could not even enter because of the cloud of glory had entered. So I just want to go uh, and look at something here, which is kind of interesting. Let's go back to those last verses in the narrative. So we walk through the notes a little bit here, but I just want to look at verses 34 to 38, okay? And it says that, that the cloud entered the tent of meeting. So the tent of meeting, as you know, it's now being used to describe the holy place because now God is going to dwell in the midst of his people. And, and so, and the glory of the Lord filled, notice how it says filled twice. It filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting, the first part of the tabernacle, because the cloud abode upon it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, okay? Oh, this is amazing. Uh, throughout all their journeys, when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would go onward, but if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not go onward till the day that it was taken up. In other words, God literally guided his people. For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. So this was not just a miracle that happened that no one saw, no, it was a miracle that people could see in their very midst. They could see the cloud of glory. They could see the, the, the glowing fire at night. And that's something incredible if you think about. Because despite this incredible miracle, despite the miracle of the manna, his people still rebelled against him in the desert. What did they need? They lacked conversion true conversion. And may we always live the faith with true conversion, authentically serving our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.